Welcome to this video with uh, Dr. Makadam and Dr. Sudarshan from the United Kingdom. I am Dr. Vidyadhar Lad. I am from Mumbai and I am a heart surgeon and a heart and lung transplant surgeon at the Kokela Benambani Hospital in Mumbai. So our topic for today is uh, heart transplant the road ahead. So we are going to look into some futuristic strategies uh, related to heart transplant. Uh, just a brief introduction of our guests here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mukadam, he is, uh, he hails uh, from Birmingham and he is from the Queen Elizabeth uh, University Hospital. He has over 18 years experience doing heart and lung transplants. He, is a, he has a, lots of publications, research papers in this field. Uh, he has received uh, several national and international awards for his contribution in the field of cardiac surgery. And next to me I have Dr. Sudarshan, she is also from the UK. She is from a, from a very famous hospital from the UK, Papworth Hospital. And uh, she also is an eminent heart and lung transplant surgeon. That's her area of interest. And besides that, uh, she is interested in MICS and TAVR, as I know. Uh, so moving ahead, um, my first question uh, is going to be related to organ preservation. Uh, ex vivo preservation of organs, uh, I think it's a known uh, technology. Uh, and recently, ex vivo preservation of uh, donor hearts has, uh, I think, uh, improved our uh, pos uh, organ preservation techniques and donor utilization. It is having a huge impact on these two factors. So my question is if you could enlighten us about Transmedics system and DCD hearts uh, and the future. Impact. So if I talk about the... Uh, Transmedics machine that has been used, the uh, organ care system, um, which um, has improved the preservation of the heart. There have been some studies which shows that because it is uh, perfusing the heart and keeping the heart in a beating state and thus is able to maintain its metabolic state and therefore there have been some study studies which shows that it, there is reduced primary graft dysfunction and also it gives a little bit of peace of mind to a surgeon that the heart is beating. You don't have to rush with the operation because nowadays we are taking on very complex cases like congenital heart, heart disease or left ventricular assist device expand. So that gives a bit of peace of mind. Sure. Um, so I agree with uh, what uh, Majid had said. And in, to try and answer your question about DCD hearts, uh, one of our biggest challenges is uh, lack of donor organs. There was a time when we used to have young uh, road traffic accident victims uh, who, uh, who had good organs uh, for us. But now our classic donor is a middle-aged middle uh, woman who is known to have hypertension, who sadly succumbed to an intracranial bleed. And therefore, they are probably one of the worst donors. So we are always on the hunt for donor organs. Um, and DCD heart transplantation has certainly provided us uh, with that expansion in numbers. Um, and I'm very humbled, on the same time proud, to come from the Royal Papad Hospital, which has actually pioneered the technique. Yes. Uh, we've done the highest number in the world, as you know. Um, the beauty about it is we therefore now have a different donor population that we hadn't tapped before. Um, we're able to assess the organs. We obviously put them on the organ care system uh, prior to transfer. Um, our outcomes are very good. Uh, but I must say it comes as a, at a huge cost. When I say cost, uh, uh, a cost to the personnel, uh, it involves a lot of uh, senior members in the team to be involved, to be able to do it, and, and the monetary cost too. So just one question related to the transmedics and the DCD donors. Uh, um, now, these are pretty recent technologies in terms of a regular use for heart mm. transplant. So how are these recipients faring compared to someone who's got a... In terms of uh, transmedics use for uh, donors from DBD hearts, um, the results are comparable. There are some studies like PROCEED2 trial which is uh, yes. come which shows that the primary graft dysfunction is more or less equal or if not better than the other technique. Yes. In, and in terms of DCD, I think uh, from PAPWO there's a lot of data coming out, isn't it? 
Uh, so we have actually analyzed our DCD hearts versus our DBD hearts that we've done in a similar time frame. And interestingly, and in some ways to me, not surprisingly, the DCD hearts do just as good or even better. Uh, because I think one of the things we forget is um, brainstem death causes a huge catecholamine surge yes. and can have a negative impact on the heart, the subendothelial tissue and everything else. And we don't always appreciate that. Sure. Whereas these donors, they are not brain dead. Yeah. So they haven't gone through that. that yeah. Yes. Excellent. Also for the DCD, I think we're taking on more younger donors Precisely. at the moment, isn't it? Exactly. So That's right, yeah. So uh, I think from organ preservation, I will move on to recipient preservation. Uh, so when I say that, I'm actually moving towards uh, the mechanical circulatory support devices. So um, now in terms of the long-term support devices, I think uh, now most of us are into using HeartMed 3 and hardware. Uh, can you enlighten us about how we are doing with these devices in terms of uh, whether they are in terms of destination therapy uh, and Second part of the question I want to know is, is there any device in the future that we are looking at where we can get rid of anticoagulation? Yes, um, obviously that's one of the holy grail of uh, LVAD uh, system, the anti requirement of the uh, anticoagulation. But in terms of uh, uh, the emergence of the LVAD therapy, I think strides have been made towards the durability of the uh, of the system as such which is now intrapericard you know you can put this in the chest and it's a small and um, the way the techniques have developed i think it has become much more easier now to implant these than than the ones which were previous generation and also these devices have come into use uh, uh, heartmate 3 just about three to four years now. So long term data is awaited, but from whatever the short term data is quite impressive actually. The the event free survival as well as the survival itself, I think it's, it's vastly different to the previous generation uh, LVAD therapy. I, so you I, want to add to that? I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, technique has evolved, you know, it's similar to our mobile phones. There was a point when yes. we had mobile phones that were several several gr hundreds of grams heavy sure. and all you could make was a telephone sure. call and now we are yeah. in a different room and yes. uh, the VADs have kind of taken a very similar role. Having said that, I still would put my hand on my heart, forgive the pun, to say there's nothing as good as a heart yet. yet. Um, having said that, I think the future is going to bring us possibly a fully implantable device. Mm -hmm. um, and with less anticoagulation, I mean, Dr. Mehra was talking about it earlier on in one of the sessions. Uh, um, they are already doing some studies on HeartMate 3 to see mm -hmm. whether they can reduce. Um, so I think the future is looking bright. And I'm sure there will come a point where probably a very easily implantable, fully implantable device that's surgeon friendly, but more importantly, patient friendly yes, too, uh, that might be hearts. With regard to your question about destination therapy, both of us come from a country where destination therapy isn't a possibility. Um, but I'm sure with time it will probably change for us too. Yeah. I mean, have, having said that, means, you know, many words have been implanted with a view to, as a bridge to transplant. Sure. But the number of patients that have received the transplant is quite small. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in, uh, at our center we have done about 100, 120 LVADs so far in, uh, in so many years and the number of transplants that we have been able to do because of shortage of availability of organs and their PRAs matching and everything. Sure. It, 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 it is about just 20 percent of them have been transplanted, though the intention was to transplant Plant them all. Plant them, Even yes. in now Germany, if you say that's an extreme example where mm. they have transplanted, uh, they have put nearly 2,000 LVADs, but they have transplanted only one or two percent of the patients. So, in non in unintentionally, these are going towards destination therapy, and there have been durable enough for for that. So, interestingly, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation data, you know, they had a collective between 2009 to 2017. 
where they have seen a steady increase in the percentage of patients having VADs who are getting transplanted. And if I'm correct, I think from 19%, they have almost, their data says 43% are getting transplanted. So my next question is, uh, is there any way we can, if we know these patients don't do as well as the patients who get a transplant straight away. So is there anything that uh, can be done to improve these outcomes? Are we changing our strategies for these patients in any way? So that data from ISGT that you quoted, the 43%, that includes the short-term LVADs uh, okay. as well as the ECMOs and BIVADs and things. So yes, that data is there from where they have been transplanted. Now, the strat strategies to, to try and improve the result is obviously optimize the patients as best as you mm -hmm. can before, before you implant LVADs or take them for transplant. And you, you know that if the substrate is good, the outcome is going to be better. And so I think our cardiologists need to help us in that to try and optimize them better. Is the immunosuppression any uh, different for these patients, considering that they are usually high PRA positive, you know, their PRAs are usually 20%, so, uh, sometimes even more? So, uh, yes, so uh, PRA probably doesn't play a huge role in this group, always. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there's a definite minority who are going down the VAD pathway for that reason because yes. they can't afford to wait for a PRA matched heart. Sure. But I don't think that per se is a reason. But overall, I think what I find is these are patients who've enjoyed a good cardiac index. Yes. For that period of time with the VAD, they have enjoyed a good cardiac index. And you and I know immediately after transplant for the first 24, 48 hours, we don't always have a decent enough, safe enough index. Yes. And therefore, I think a, a lot of insult is done to these guys who enjoy mm -hmm. a good uh, cardiac output up to the time of transplantation, unlike our other population who haven't had a VAD, where anything you give is going to be better than what they've been exposed to. So they are much more preconditioned than yes. this group. Um, and of course, the, you cannot underestimate the impact of reduced stenotomy, all the dissection, oh, yes. the fact that they were on anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy oh, yes. makes them bleed, and all yes, of those little things uh, add to and The renal impairment as well Absolutely. is, oh, yes. and there's data to show that sure. uh, these patients do have more renal impairment than it, especially when you add the immunosuppression to the mix. So, uh, now, talking about the rescue devices or the short-term devices, sometimes we have to give them for a bridge to bridge or, you know, bridge to a durable device or bridge to decision or it could be, uh, you know. So, as I know, there are four options that currently we have, like Tandem Heart is there, there is Impala, there is uh, Centromag, and then there is, you know, Arterial ECMO. Uh, what is the strategy at uh, your respective institutes? So which is the preferred device? So uh, at our center, like other centers, it has evolved over a period of time. So the previously, we used to just rescue with ECMO. Um, but now what happens is it's, yeah, first is ECMO, but then it is evaluated. And at the first instance where we see uh, volume overload, where there's an uh, effect on the lungs, we put an impeller, uh, the impeller 5, um, in order to offload the LV and if um, that doesn't, uh, if still the patient doesn't get transplanted or is not a candidate for transplant, then they go into the BIVAD therapy. And we try and avoid transplanting from ECMO directly because we know the data shows that the results are poorer if you transplant from uh, uh, ECMO directly. So I, from what I understand at your institute, I think Impella is uh, the device that you're preferring more and more for rescuing these patients? Would that be a correct along with the, Along with the ECMO. Oh, okay. So we are, we are very similar. Um, but uh, one thing I would say is if, uh, if I have a patient who's basically been transferred from another center with unknown neurology and we want to give him the benefit of the doubt or him or her, our strategy would be to put them on ECMO straight away. Yes. Try and wake them up, see what their head is like. Is it genuinely single organ failure and is the rest going to be recoverable before we commit ourselves? Um, we had Impella many, many years ago. Uh, we then got rid of it. 
we've just got Impella back in the last yes. few months. So, so Impella is very new to us. Yes. Uh, so our strategy would be either peripheral or central ECMO, mm. then to be converted to either a long-term LVAD if their RV is okay, or, or BIVADs uh, towards transplantation. So when you move from ECMO to say, whatever, Impella or the next device, how long do you wait or it's a decision which is taken within a week? So as uh, Catherine said, um, initially uh, when you rescue somebody from ECMO, you have to assess yes. whether they are re recovering or their body is coping, uh, what damage has already occurred because of their low cardiac output or, or the crash. And if the organs are recovery, then we, we tend to wait um, for a week assess the neurology before we take the next step or of moving towards uh, either uh, adding impella or towards a bioventricular assist device. And so I think we'll move a little away from our surgical discussion and probably take on immunosuppression. Now CNI, purine inhibitors and steroids are pretty much the cornerstone of the immunosuppression strategy that is used for heart transplants. Uh, are we seeing uh, any newer agents or let's say better antibodies uh, to kind of work around this because you, we all know that there are problems associated with our current strategy. Mm -hmm. There is rejection, there is uh, nephrotoxicities and then there are the long term concerns about uh, malignancies and uh, uh, you know, CAV and infection. So with that perspective, is there anything changing in this? Yeah, of course, there is there's a lot of work being done uh, on the newer immunosuppressants. And obviously, the, the ideal will be to have something that develops tolerance where, you know, the, they are working on the T cell regulators where uh, uh, it is still not complete. The work is still going on to try and have tolerance. In terms of immunosuppression, yes, uh, serolimus and evrolimus, these are a tor inhibitors which are less nephrotoxic and also they are uh, effective against trying to control the graft vasculopathy or delay the onset of graft vasculopathy from the data that is available and antibodies you want to add about that. Um, so there are antibodies available, new antibodies which like betelaceptic which have been effective in the renal transplant population yes. which have been now tried in the cardiac and the lung transplant population as well. Yeah. Anything about tolerance? Uh, so uh, immune tolerance I think is going to happen. happen. Um, at the moment I must say the cocktail we use seems to work for our patients. Um, in some ways it's an unfair question for me to try and answer being a surgeon because for us it's very much managed by our cardiology colleagues yes. and they do a superb job at it um, and I know they try to minimize the immunosuppressants that yes. are given um, uh, to, uh, over a period of time and cater depending on the patient and their episodes of rejection and things like that. So I think this is an exciting time for heart transplant. Uh, not I mean, definitely in our country, because there has been a resurrection of our transplant in the country, but definitely world over as well, uh, because we are short of time. I had lots of questions to answer, maybe another time or probably during your uh, lecture tomorrow. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, research happening in terms of uh, all the strategies that we discussed. Uh, I'm sure future uh, research will throw light or probably give us new uh, solutions, but I think it will also bring forward new questions and new challenges. Uh, I think we'll wait and see. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.